Welcome to our latest Nesta Talks 2, our conversational event series with today's most exciting thinkers on the big topics related to our mission and innovation methods. We are Nesta, the UK's innovation agency for social good. We design, test and scale solutions to society's biggest problems. Our three missions are to help people live healthy lives, create a sustainable future where the economy works for both people and planet, and give every child a fair start. My name is Emma McFarland, and I'm the design lead in the Fairest Start mission, which aims to narrow the development gap and outcomes gap between young children growing up in poverty and the peers who are not. I work to embed innovation and design practice in the work we do, so it's inclusive, innovative and impactful, and involves families in the design and creation of solutions. Prior to joining Nesta, I worked for over 20 years in the arts and cultural sector across creative producing and innovation roles in a diverse range of organisations, from the National Gallery and Studio Wayne McGregor to smaller regional dance companies, festivals and artists working across arts and social justice. And my work often involved creating and producing work with and for children, families and vulnerable groups. So I'm incredibly excited to be in conversation here today with Dr Penny Hay. Penny is a reader in creative teaching and learning, senior lecturer in arts education and a research fellow in the Research Centre for Cultural and Creative Industries at Bath Spa University. She is also Director of Research for House of Imagination and an arts-based charity devoted to researching imagination and creativity alongside children and young people. Penny has dedicated her professional life to exploring how we can nurture artistic expression and create the educational, family and community environments in which humans and children in particular can realise their full potential, countering social, environmental and racial injustice in more vulnerable communities. Her list of achievements and advisory and professional roles is vast, but alongside those, I think it's important to mention Penny's work as an artist and teacher in schools, work which underpins all of her research. In May, Penny's book, Children Are Artists, Supporting Children's Learning Identity as Artists, is published by Routledge, and this draws on Penny's PhD research in this same area. Before we start, I want to highlight that Nesta and Penny actually go back a long way. Uh, 20 years ago, Nesta were one of the first funders of Penny's 5x5x5 project, which involved five artists, five early years settings and five cultural centres working in partnership to support young children in their exploration, communication and expression of creative ideas. And it's a project which laid the foundations for her PhD and has morphed into her House of Imagination initiative today. Right, before we dive into our conversation with Penny, some housekeeping. In the first part of this session, Penny and I will be in conversation, but please do join the conversation in the comments box on the right-hand side of your screen. And please post your questions to Penny. And in the second half of the session, I'll be putting those two, some of those questions to her. And lastly, closed captions can be accessed via the LinkedIn live stream. So after that, what feels like quite a long intro, and without further delay, I'd like to welcome Penny to this Nesta Talks To conversation. Thank Hello, you. Penny. Thank it's you. Great so to see you <laughs> Um, so Penny, your CV and achievements are vast. They span teaching, research and thought leadership across arts, education, creativity, child development and social justice, to name just a few. Um, so to kick off today, for those listening, could you perhaps sum up in a few sentences, I know this is going to be a difficult one, um, the key themes which unite your work across these areas? Yes, sorry, Emma, I was just saying thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, of course. And just to say a big thank you to Nesta as one of the first believers in our work. And you planted the seeds that uh, have grown our amazing charity now working closely in partnership with our university. So, yes, on a daily basis, um, I work with students, educators, artists and creative professionals alongside communities and set up experimental sites of um, hopefully pedagogical innovation, so spaces of imaginative inquiry, reimagining learning and education, um, and especially to embed the arts and creativity and imagination in everything we do. So our purpose at Basma University is to challenge and co-create with our students and staff to realise how we can um, flourish and for our own benefit for the wider good. By doing this, we we will think and make the world better. So everything we do together is about empowering children and young people's imagination to save the planet, especially now in the face of the ecological emergency and to make the world a better place. So innovation uh, follows imagination and hopefully it'll change the world. 
I think the, the key themes around um, our work align with Nesta's mission, as you say. And I think it, the investment in the early years is absolutely vital for our future society. Future society is plural. I strongly believe that art is a human right and that all schools should be art schools, uh, to borrow a few phrases from Bob and Roberta Smith. And in fact, in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 31 is about every child having the right to participate freely in cultural life and the arts. So to kind of sum it up, I think arts, the arts, art makes visible our human creative potential. I think creative is, creativity is in everything, not just the arts. I think we learn in and about and through the arts to imagine possibilities and explore ideas and express our personal social and cultural identities. Art invites us to make sense of the, wor the world and to make meaning. So creativity, as I said, is in everything and it's a way of being in the world. I often say that art is in everything. It isn't just a subject at school. And what art does is manifest that creativity and imagination daily and central to our methodology at House of Imagination um, and at the university is the belief in everybody's human capacity to be creative, to be an artist. So the charity, House of Imagination, which was called 505, which you helped grow, we, we create spaces for young people to imagine and build a better future. We work alongside artists and educators, cultural, creative professionals. We co-create spaces to develop children's imagination and creativity and thinking about how we can prioritise um, the four C's. So I'll pause there and I'll tell you about our signature projects um, in a minute, which are School That Walls, co-founded with the Egg Theatre and Forest of Imagination, co-founded with Andrew Grant, who's famous for the super trees in Singapore. Amazing. And I'm going to sort of seek from that. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about those and the four C's. Um, but can you tell us a little bit? I mean, you've covered so many different areas. I mean, you've already mentioned a few names, but can you tell me a little bit about your biggest influences and inspiration in your work in terms of that crucial role of creativity? Like you say, not just in terms of art, but in terms of you know, the fulfillment of hum human potential. Um, and the role it can play in children's development, and particularly um, with more vulnerable groups. Um, Absolutely. So I think our mantra is inviting everyone to have the freedom to follow our fascinations and actually researching children, researching the world, which is our first book together. Um, and that really puts imagination at the heart of learning. And I think I'm... I've learned so much alongside children and people and students, as well as, you know, colleagues and peers and educators across the world. And I think the important thing is the kind of co-design and the co-learning. So in partnership with Bath Bay University, I work alongside students and professionals to co-design a creative, reflective pedagogy using the city or the village or the town, wherever we are across the world, um, as a campus for learning, as an experimental pedagogical site. So as I said, School Without Walls, for instance, was co-founded with the Egg Theatre, a theatre for children and young people in Bath, and working alongside us as we co-design the curriculum uh, uh, based on creative inquiry, embedding the arts of the heart, and that's thanks to long-term funding from Paul Hamlin. Uh, but we're thinking about next stages now. And I think children are active citizens. So their voices and their ideas, their agency are really important. And similarly, Forest of Imagination, we scored that was, isn't it? Some um, 12th year now, gosh. Um, and we've worked across 12, 12 schools across the local um, landscape. But Forest of Imagination is celebrating its 10th year now. And again, we're learning together. We're creating, we're manifesting that learning community, that community of practice that puts imagination at the heart and we're inviting the whole community to have a conversation on the, about the importance of nature and creativity and especially our collective imagination in the face of the poly crisis that we're witnessing you know the war and pandemic and the uh, the climate emergency as i said and i think that what forest for imagination does really well is make these processes visible um, and that we can explore new ways of learning together if you have a look at our recent film on our website, it is a living classroom. Every classroom should be a work of art. And we elicited the children's ideas, how they might be invited in to this kind of um, imaginative learning space that prioritizes social, environmental, racial, 
disability justice, or, you know, ev everything very important around social justice. So in terms of big influences, definitely children. When I was a primary teacher, early years, I specialised in early years primary and special needs, um, worked with many children with English as a second language and refugee families. And I, my kind of, my interest was always in marginalised communities. So working with particularly school refusers and re-engaging the children through their arts. And so I would say, you know, what would you like to do? What's your ideas? How do you want to state them? How do you want to share them? And I suppose in that context, I was very influenced by the practice in Reggio Emilia in northern Italy, where, you know, everything you need to know from children is with them and alongside them, to borrow a quote from Loris Malagetzi. And I think that if we allow children to express their ideas and their thoughts and feelings and we make sense of the world together, that it's an a shared inquiry in the way that um, I'm very influenced by a, a colleague, a friend, our patron also, um, which uh, Iram Siraj, you, might know her, you may know her work at the University of Oxford. She talks about sustained shared thinking um, and really respecting the, the children's ideas. And that's the starting point for the learning framework. Mm -hmm. I'll pause there. Well, that seems beautifully, Penny, on the, the next question I was going to ask, which is around, I mean, you worked with Sir Ken Robinson, of course, um, and he advocated for a revolution in our systems of education along the lines you're talking about the way we run our organizations and structure our wider society so they bring out the best in everyone and fulfill human potential and of course he was a fierce advocate for the role of creativity and imagination in helping us to do this but and you've touched on this already in our in the current educational system that we're living in um how do we go about nurturing creativity and imagination when you know, there's this false demarcation between the arts and sciences, this separation of subjects into STEM and STEAM and various other acronyms. I mean, how do we actually go about doing this? What, what role can artists play? And what, what would you like to see change, I guess, in the education system? What can help that process along? Um, Absolutely. Into... Yes. I mean, in the same way, you know, I've, I've been very lucky in my career to work with amazing people like Dennis Atkinson at Goldsmiths and Obviously, Anna Craft was my PhD supervisor, and Sir Ken, you know, we met, um, gosh, in 1989, and uh, and I worked with him all the way through the 90s, um, and he really inspired me, and now we're lucky to work with his daughter, um, Kate Robinson. Ken was our patron for 20 years with our charity, and, and you know, we're doing a lot of work in his legacy uh, and together, and obviously, teaching for creativity and teaching creatively is so important and I think that's what I learned from my PhD that you know at the core of children's own self-concept of becoming and being an artist being creative is children's agency and their interest their intrinsic motivation so you can follow your fascinations and and go anywhere I think I was also influenced by you know the way that if I can say it right, Mihai um, sent uh, on the importance of flow. It's useful being dyslexic sometimes, and the freedom to, to follow these interests. And and also Andrew Britton talks about you know making learning, thinking through making poesis, think creating something out of nothing. We're making learning as we're moving through, and this is where teaching creatively, but also teaching for creativity, is really important. And I think that that focus on opening up new spaces of possibility, um, especially civic spaces for learning, so that pedagogy becomes public, public pedagogy. You can see, you manifest that possibility. You have these spaces of imagination, and in our case, with forest of imagination, reflection in nature. Um, I think you know, forest of imagination also shines a light on the importance of global forests and, and conservation, but I think importantly, how we can have a, meta a metaphorical, if I can say it, a metaphorical framing for an organic education system mm -hmm. where learning's nurtured and children are, well, he says, you know, free range and not the product of a factory model. I mean, do, do um, I'm doing a plug for Kate's book, but uh, Kate finished Ken's manifesto, Imagine If, and there's a beautiful quote, the lesson we most need to learn is that more to life on earth than human beings and more to being human than self-interest. Our futures all depend 
on learning this lesson by heart. And I think importantly, reimagining the education system, you know, it, it, it is broken in some countries. Mm -hmm. I think in England it needs uh, reimagining and I think that we can do this together. I think the creativity exchange work with the Arts Council, I think every authority needs a creativity collaboratives. And I think importantly, probably the most important thing, and I'll pause then, is that I've been hugely influenced by Nora Bateson's work, the daughter of Gregory Bateson, who wrote Steps to an Ecology of Mind. So, you know, she said on a call the other day, I'm hugely excited to be working with her and Alf Coles at the University of Bristol, but to learn like a meadow, to learn like a forest, everything is connected in kind of mutual learning, learning as a living system. We can learn how to learn and, and we are part of nature. It's, she says it so beautifully. And I think that schools are part of this ecosystem and that we can invite that kind of response to um, thinking about um, imagination as our super imagination as our superpower which is a, a quote from our wonderful VC Sue Rigby um, and together we're working on that concept with the students and the local schools on Bath as a city of imagination so yeah I'll, pa I'll pause there. So that's a beautiful place of course I mean learning like a meadow I and mean, that's such a fantastic um, inspirational visual metaphor I feel like I want to make a an image which represents that and have it here I think um, and that's just such a, a wonderful way you've described that holistic system coming together um, and that involves the arts and cultural community it involves schools it involves community organizations it involves parents it involves the whole holistic system around a child doesn't it and that's what we you know in fairer start we're trying to think about increasingly as the child as, as the center of this whole ecosystem um, and how we can work with that ecosystem to create that positive change that was uh that was a really lovely, lovely way of summing that up. Um, I just want to touch on something you just mentioned then, which is um, teaching for creativity and teaching creatively. And perhaps you can just um, just sum up quite quickly what you think are the, what's the key differences between those two concepts. Well, I think you put in the call that um, my, my book that came out last year is called Teaching Art Creatively. It's part of Theresa Kremen's series. Um, teaching creatively and of course I joked with her and said well why wouldn't we teach art creatively but actually it does need teaching creatively rather than having a kind of packaged prescriptive set of objectives that immediately close down children's ideas we need to open up the ideas and invite that sense of possibility so I always talk to my students about you know it's about possibilities not prescriptions and I think that that teaching creatively and teaching for creativity we're nurturing then the children's creative dispositions for learning so thinking about um you know going back to your previous point about uh, art art and creativity is in everything there isn't um a division between the arts and science see art the arts and sciences you know it is we are not in a silo based we shouldn't be in a silo based delivered package curriculum we should be inviting connections with everything like the forest and I think that's what oh, my, my brilliant co-chair of trustees Doug Lachlan um, who trained in art and engineering you know he talks a lot about arts and earring and that you can't create something without imagining in all disciplines so you know for instance he said when I was talking to him the other day you know there is influence across all the kind of transdisciplinary contexts and that beauty and intellect matters in great solutions so this is growing this kind of sense of imagination and creativity and innovation in our youngest children and we should invest in the early years it's much more important then that we'll have um you know that better opportunities and more aspirations for, for better lives later no matter what the child's background or circumstance so i think that you know supporting learning and and growing this kind of habit of mind with imagination right at the, the forefront. We're working to go to the Institute of Imagination in London with our university and our charity in partnership with Vlad Glovenu at um, City University in Dublin. And we're really exploring this kind of space of imagination. So thinking about how we can remove these barriers to subject silos and mix, as Doug says, mix the art and sciences to make magic, you know. I think it's really important that we prove that imagination has real, tangible, investable value. 
Thank you, Penny. I'm going to I can move us um, on now to think more specifically about um, younger children. Um, so our mission has a particular focus on children from birth to two years, that crucial 1,001 days of, of life when so much um, neurological development happens. Um, and the interactions, between the crucial interactions between parents and children during this phase. Um, so obviously during that period of naught to two, the family and the home environment have far more impact on children's development than schools and preschool settings. I mean, it's all about the family and, and that community as well around the child. So I'd really like to find out more about how you think arts, the arts and cultural sector, artists can support um, nurturing home learning environments, particularly in more vulnerable families. Yes, I know that's absolutely you know, right at the heart of all the work that you do, Emma, at Nesta. And, you know, I think that whole focus on co-creation is so important. So if you're thinking about the, the, the home learning environment, you're thinking about the principles underpin the early years, you know, from birth, well, pre-birth even, from birth, you know, the first thousand hours, first thousand days, first two thousand days, you know, mm -hmm. the first three years are so important. And I think that focus on um, creative values, creative dispositions, creative environments and creative relationships, which are the four strands of research in our work with the charity and university. So focusing on, you know, how then do we nurture a unique and a strong child with capabilities from the moment of birth? How do we make sure that it's about holistic development, the whole child, you know, not just their cognitive development, but their affective development to create enab enabling environments that um, are creative? And in Reggio, they talk about the environment as the third teacher so that you're optimizing the creative environment for the children and the adult is then a companion alongside um, the children so these relationships then empower the children to um, to take risks in their learning and play and learn how to learn at our university we've reframed our PGC actually so um, some of the students are specializing in very young children and right through to um, well, I teach on the early years primary and I'm a guest lecturer on the um, secondary course as well. But all of our works around this, the four C's. You know, so with, if keeping those in your kind of back pocket, mm -hmm. you can pull them out when you need them. Just you've got that as a framework that creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, care. I mean, I would go beyond that, you know, compassion, curiosity, climate, hundreds of C's. And that where teaching creatively um, it's really important, but in the home, that sense of e exploration and inquiry and wonder and playing alongside the child. We had an amazing project with um, Bristol local authority working in three um, uh, areas of socioeconomic deprivation. And we were thinking about um, how we could then bring those parents and practitioners on our learning journey with us. So building their capacities and capabilities and you know taking pressure off them to be you know the best parent it's it's about learning together and and joining your child on that journey in their learning so and imaginative learning you know whether they have special needs or english as a second language or neurodiversity being playful and welcoming so children having agency is really important you know so that they can decide what they want to play and follow in their curiosity and they're finding their own voice they transform materials and say what they want to say mm -hmm. to make meaning um i mean i'll just I'll, I'll pause on that because we have a lovely phrase that came out of our research together um from our wonderful colleague Ed Harker, who happened to be a student of mine at the Institute of Education, and then uh, we've worked together many years, and he was our chair of trustees. He said, "You know what children are doing, and we're noticing their patterns and their schemas. Was we're playing alongside children. We're we're." He talked about magical objects of transformation. So we're really responding to um, the way that they. Um, my, I know my daughter was totally obsessed with enveloping herself with uh, materials and um, 
making dens for her for her animals and so on. So yes, I'll I'll pause there because I could come back to that. Yeah. No, thank you, Penny. I think finding those ways in which we can, sticking more vulnerable communities, can um, find more creative spaces for parents and children to come into and to explore and develop. Um, you know, those sort of playful interactions um, is, is so important, isn't it? And I know that's a, that's a focus of, of, of Nesta's work in this mission. Um, and the crucial role that artists can play in that as well. And I know there are a lot of arts organisations involved in that age group and in that work. Um, I'm going to follow up now. I mean, you've touched on the uh, your work in Bristol and, um, and there's a fantastic report. It's called Sense of Place. And really in that work in children's centres, particularly, you highlighted um, the role of, of co-creation and how important that was. And that really spoke to me because in, in my innovation practice, you know, creating those meaningful spaces for families to co-design and co-create with professionals as equal and men valued members of the innovation design team is really important. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear more about how you approached um, co-creation with parents in those projects in Bristol and how you create those you know, meaningful, equitable spaces where lived experience is given the same value as professional experience. Yes, absolutely. I think I think sharing the kind of principles of the learning around, you know, if you think about the, the key characteristics of learning, not just in the early years, but, you know, being active, being creative, playing, exploring, imagining, etc., and I think it it is really important that the the work in um, well in all of our work is co-created so that communities are involved and that it's co-designed. Um, we use in a sense of place. Obviously, we elicit the ideas from the children, but also alongside the parents and carers and the educators working alongside them. So the artist voice, you know, as lenders of tools and processes are. It is also so imp important. I think in terms of um, the thinking about um, the kind of pedagogical approach of co-production and co-creation, I think we I co-authored the Creative Pedagogy's Impact Case Study with Professor Bambos Yinka at Basfa University, and we looked at this notion of evolving teachers and creative professionals to reconceptualize creativity and professional art practice and develop co-design pedagogical models that focused on relationships and agency uh, collaboration and co-inquiry so the idea that you know we are i mean our university has just turned itself into a social enterprise we the, the social enterprise gold mark it's it's a really brilliant concept that we're working alongside the community in service to the community we're not doing things to them and I think the, the important kind of framing around equity and diversity and inclusion you know it's not and to borrow a phrase from Claire Thurman it's not the illusion of inclusion it's genuine invitation to everybody to be involved to work together to think about reimagining learning and redesign these pedagogical approaches so that people feel that they belong and they can have agency in that process. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely vital. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much, I mean, if we get time, we'll touch on it later, but there is so much that I think it overlaps in terms of like, the more I've been reading about your work and teaching for creativity and your approaches that overlaps with um, design-based innovation practice. There's so many parallels in terms of the work we're trying to do, um, but it's in organisations or in schools with children. Um, yeah, I feel like we need a whole session just to explore that alone. But um, I'm going to move us on. Um, and I, I want to ask a question now. You know, we do increasingly um, live in a world, unfortunately, where if it can't be measured, it isn't given value. Um, I think a lot of us struggle with that in a lot of our working lives, um, particularly in areas like the arts or creativity, where it's it's much more intangible and challenging to measure. But can you tell us um, how you've gone about evaluating the impact of creativity on children's development and outcomes and your thoughts on the value of this kind of measurement? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a kind of standing joke with our trustees the other day was, you know, we're, we're using science to invest in art in that sense that, for instance, our sense of place research that I've just mentioned, it's multimodal, it's integrated, it's creative, it's evaluated 
evaluating alongside the community. Um, Iram Siraj was our mentor in that process. We worked very um, closely with the communities and Catherine Evans, who was doing her PhD with us at the time, she's written beautifully on school readiness. I might mention that in a minute. She's now teaching at Plymouth University. But I think the idea that, um, and in fact, at our university, we're also looking at multimodal assessment to integrate live projects and think about how our students can take responsibility and co-design alongside um, each other with peer assessment and co-assessment as well. So, for instance, I run the art specialism on the postgraduate certificate for education course, and um, it's very much around, you know, keeping a portfolio, keeping a reflective journal, having an exhibition, making presentations, sharing with each other, having skills to share sessions, bringing artists in, learning about their habits of mind, how artists work alongside children. Um, I was very lucky to work at Tate Modern before it opened on the learning policy and co-design the artist teacher scheme. So that taught me a lot about evaluation. I worked with Emily Pringle, who's head of research. In fact, I think she just might have left, but I might uh, I might call her up. But the idea that you know we're thinking about the actual art process informing evaluation. We have a brilliant impact um, case. We have impact research fellow at Basfair University, um, Astrid Brill, and we work closely with the National Centre for Academic and Cultural Exchange, NK. So we've really been thinking about multimodal, um, shiny case studies that really show how you can make creativity visible. And in fact, the research we're doing, we've just written up a case study that I can share with everyone with the Living Tree Exhibition at the Egg Theatre last year, um, during COVID, Kate Cross, the director, rang me up and said, help, um, we've got an empty theatre, what can we do? So we invited children to inform that co-design and we, we created a beautiful installation that um, brought a real forest into the Egg Theatre, but also we had a conversation with children about what it is to be, um, you know, responding to more hopeful futures with clim the climate emergency. And that has been um, documented and evaluated alongside our team. And we're just about to bring in um, some colleagues from Oxford University to think about a multimodal case study with Forest, Forest of Imagination this year. We're going to be at the Assembly Rooms in Bath, um, working with the National Trust in partnership. So that's really exciting. And, and I think in a way, just to kind of summarise, I would just suggest that in a way it's like an artwork. Um, I'm very really impressed with the work that um, Joe, Joanne Shakir and, and um, John McMahon and the team are doing at the RSA around collective futures and all of that. It's a beautiful set of case studies on their website. Have a look around the kind of people, place, planet, all the P's, possibility. <laughs> uh, just that notion that you can see how people are collecting these stories and then sharing them together so we can think about more more hopeful, more regenerative futures. That's a, that's a beautiful way to think about evaluation. And I think you know, that, that um, focus on really um, enhancing the qualitative, the value of the qualitative research and work that we can do um, and looking at that in different ways, as you've just highlighted, it's really important. And um, I'm just conscious of time. I'm gonna move us on. I know there's a couple of things we still want to touch on if you get a chance. Um, but I really want to, um, at this point, just bring in um, some of the questions. We've been getting some questions through. So thank you so much to all those who've been uh, commenting and joining in the conversation online. Um, I'm just going to take a little moment. Um, we've got some a few questions that have come in from people. Um, I think the first one I'm going to ask is, um, going back to I think that demarcation between the arts and sciences that we talk about, uh, spoke about earlier, Philip Noble has asked a question, um, how involved are you at primary level in the art of science and science in art? That's a very good question. I, I, think, I, I think I would come back to the notion that art is in everything and inquiry is in everything. So the way that we find out and discover in a scientific context is very similar to the way that artists pursue their interests in the world and I think if we could have that framing around learning like a meadow then we would see how everything is connected and I think obviously you know the kind of 
the way that we can learn how to learn is then applicable in every context, whether you have an aspiration to be an artist, a professional artist or a scientist, at, at any one time, children are um, curious artists, they are curious scientists, they're curious and creative mathematicians. Um, they can play with, with language. Think about the lovely way Michael Rosen uses language in a, such a creative way. And I think that, that I wouldn't want to kind of divide the two. I'd want to borrow from each and have them in that mutual space of learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to move us on now to another question. This comes from Sam Glazer. Um, who says that they share this belief that our work needs to be available to groups and individuals who are marginalised and hard to reach, and this is at the heart of their work. But how can we articulate and embrace this aim whilst negotiating the culturally patronising assumptions that seem embedded in that language? Well, that's a that's a question for a, a, a several hour conversation. <laughs> yes, I I think. I think it's um, I think it's time that we use a different kind of language around education and around learning, and I think that we can do that together. I'm working with a brilliant group of people, Professor Sathil Krishna, Chris Bagley, and B. Herbert from States of Mind, and the big education team, um, Scott Bolt from Belfast. You know, we're thinking together about what what are the better questions we can ask of education. And um, or oh, when the Edge Foundation, I mustn't forget Ollie, but and Cassie, that whole focus about thinking, okay, well, these are um, quite delivered and packaged concepts of education, especially maybe in the early years, we need to start by thinking about more of the school as a system. Um, Scott uses a lovely phrase because he talks about, you know, we don't really need the word curriculum, the curriculum is a child, start with the child. And then, then the the community is the school, and then the parents and carers and guardians are part of that system of relationships. As um, colleagues and Reggio Emilia talk, that everything affects something else. And I think if we can think about the language being much more respectful and generous and kind, so that it isn't about a kind of punitive, um, you know, it's a brilliant organisation called More Than a School. Children are more than a school. My daughter said to me when she was doing her GCSEs, you know, I will not be defined by my grades, mum. And I think it's, she did really well, but despite, she went to a brilliant state school, luckily. But I think it's really important that, you know, we really think about the language we're using and it's not a deficit model. I didn't like, in COVID, I didn't like the phrase catch up curriculum. I didn't like the, the phrase, you know, and in, in closing the gap even has some of its problems because it divides the community and, and actually we are together in a community and we need to support each other and it doesn't matter your background or circumstance it's everybody can be in part of this conversation and I think the reimagining all our futures together the UNESCO report last year year before now um, was really powerful and we've, been, we've done quite a lot of work with Noah Sobe, who's spoken at our university a couple of times, um, and watch this space. We will be thinking about that, mm -hmm. about the Arts and Schools project. But yeah, I'll pause mm -hmm. there. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a really good point about. And you've made so many good points, but the point about the separation of people, um, and yes, of course, we have to acknowledge that there are groups and uh, groups of people who experience a number of um, situations which make lives more challenging. Um, and not to take away from that, but um, this concept of positionality is something that um, I know in the design team we were introduced to by fantastic early years resident Donna Gaywood in Nesta. And the idea that actually all of us have different aspects that we bring or experiences we bring to our lives and, and identifying, actually highlighting those and understanding them. There are things that have been positive, there are things that have been negative in everyone's lives. Um, and actually that can help you to really um, see, see, see the world in a much more holistic way, like in, and, and this sort of, uh, avoid the separation into groups. I'll stop there because I'm probably waffling now, but I'm, I just made me think about that positionality. Um, I'm, the next question comes from, I think it's uh, Jamie Elliott Harris, or it might be Millie Butters, um, maybe their um, 
name is somewhat different on there on the thread that's come through um and they say that some of their work entails tabletop gaming role playing with children which they find is a great way to encourage creative thinking and problem solving in a shared imaginative setting and they'd love to hear you speak uh, more to the, the power and potential of gamifying learning or similar kinds of child led, acti led activities um, which focus on giving children agency in a safe space. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I've, I've done a lot of work in playful pedagogies, using playful pedagogies. In fact, uh, we've got a lovely conversation going on with the RSA about uh, the relationship with between play and creative learning. So watch this space. But the idea that, I mean, gamifying, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't use that phrase myself. It's not my it's not my expertise necessarily, but what I can bring to this conversation is the kind of focus on children's agency and creativity and imagination. So giving children the time in the space, wherever they are, the freedom to follow their fascinations and interests and think about how the playfulness, experimentation, exploration, you know, we talk about exploring and playing and creating and sharing and learning and all of those um, ideas that learning is in in motion. And in Reggio Emilia, they talk about the progettazione, the project moving forward, it's not a literal translation, but it gives the idea that it's about inquiry. And that's at the heart of School Without Walls, that it's about co-inquiry really listening carefully to what the children are interested in to then offer them the, the appropriate tools and materials to then express what they want to say. So you can still have a structure or context, but then allowing that space between. And that's how I kind of think about, you know, at the moment we've got a national curriculum, but moving in the spaces in between. And I think that's where that kind of playful gamifying could come in. So I think whatever the creative environment, I mean, play and disruption and everyday creative activism, I think this is where artists can be role models because they are playing all the time with ideas and making learning, as Andrew said, Andrew Bruton. So, yeah, I hope that answers you. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, got another question here from Kate Mason, who says, children learn like a forest or she's quoting you children learn like a forest um and asks what might be learned from other cultures about uh, reimagining uh, learning and pedagogy and how does this connect with the climate emergency compassion and the community of care well kate that's a really good question and, and i have to declare that kate is one of the most brilliant trustees that we have in our charity but i haven't been primed with that question <laughs> So I will, um, yes, and Kate knows that uh, we talked about our, so I think in the, in the pandemic, you know, nature saved me and creativity saved me. It's a real lifeline. And I've learned so much. I, I work with this wonderful PhD student in, um, she's got a placement year in Ecuador and she's learning from the indigenous wisdom of the forest. Um, her name's Livia Filatico and uh, I met her through the We've got a, a lovely project. You must look it up because it might not be time to share it, but it's called the Rabbit Holes Collective. And in in the first lockdown, um, my amazing line manager, Kate Pollinger, said, would you like to apply for the expanded performance uh, cohort, which is part of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D project? And in that context, I met this uh, wonderful, um, I think Ian's title is the chief fire starter for BBC creative R&D and together we had a conversation about imagination anyway long story short I met Liv, Liv then became part of the Rabbit Holes Collective then Liv has a fully funded PhD at McGill University in Montreal and her placement year is in the forest so she's working with Schumacher which is learning from the forest and co-designing a creative learning framework I don't you know the, the word curriculum is not quite right is it it's about starting with ideas and in, in my PhD, I fell down that rabbit hole. Maybe that's where the idea came from. But I fell down a rabbit hole and I met um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari uh, and the idea of their kind of philosophy and thinking around lines of flight and rhizomatic learning. So the Rabbit Holes Collective now and lives part of it, collecting 
song and bird song from the forest, collecting the sounds of the roots of the forest and mycelium network, thinking about the rain and the leaves falling. And this is all with the children learning. In fact, Margaret Heffernan visited, Kate knows this because I think she was there, uh, Margaret Heffernan visited the Margaret Heffern, by the way, is a brilliant thinker, author, entrepreneur, as you know, and she visited the forest and she said something so beautiful. Um, it was Andrew Amundsen's um, installation in the Ek Theatre. So Andrew works with Vim Vendors and um, Olafia Leeson in Berlin and co-designing this beautiful forest with our design students and um, inviting the local community to come and witness this beautiful creativity it was really also learning about nature and how we are part of nature and how we can take care of it in a most beautiful and I think uh, Margaret's phrase you know full of joy and delight so I think that's that's a really important question Kate thank you mm. yeah thank you Kate that was uh, brought together so many different strands um, I'm going to bring together now a question that we were um, going to explore um, of time and a question from Andrew Brewerton. Um, um, and the question we were, the theme I wanted to explore with you, Penny, was really about obviously, this, uh, Nessa talks about this concept of school readiness. Um, and I'm interested in, okay, yes, school children being ready for school. What does that mean? Um, but what does it mean if you turn it on its head and think about what would it mean if schools were actually child ready? Um, and I think this ties in really nicely to Andrew's question, which is what would you identify as the structural obstacles to your practice of creative learning and teaching within the current educational orthodoxy? So I thought it brings those two themes together quite nicely. Oh, Andrew. Andrew's written a brilliant chapter in uh, the V&A publication about making learning, and I, I totally recommend it. I think it's it's really difficult at the moment, isn't it? Because we are kind of caught in a situation where we want to change things, but we have a given um, structure. So I think it is about I think it is about systemic change, and I think it's the right time for this. And I'm very pleased to be part of the Arts in Schools um, project that Sally Bacon, Pauline Hamlin are leading with the Gulbenkian Foundation and New Direction, and that is about really thinking about what is school and really thinking about starting from the child and the importance of the arts and, and not least saving the arts in schools and hopefully we'll be co-convening a group of young people in the cross-party uh, political group at the House of Commons soon. The work we've done, I think Andrew knows, is around spaces of liberated learning, opening up these spaces for, especially for more vulnerable families, to then think about how we can play and learn um, together in forests and fields and um, that's why the work with School That Walls is so important for us for imagination because it shows what's possible it manifests it every day and I think we're caught with a system that is broken and we need to not just it, we need to absolutely reimagine it together so it's not just the language it's actually the processes as well and breaking down the walls to use a phrase from school that walls breaking down the walls between the kind of cultural centers and schools and inviting families to believe what is possible um and to un unlearn unconstrain uh, the families through really imaginative playful learning so that they are well that they feel welcome that they are welcome and the whole city or town or village wherever you are is a playground of learning. I think that's where the work with the RSA would be really important. And I think, again, coming back to, I think, Andrew, you mentioned this on a different call, that I think it's really important to bring the context of education and the arts and social care and health together. You know, I, I believe that we should have artists and art therapists and researchers in every educational setting so that I mean that's how 5 by 5 started 22 years ago we wanted to be researching alongside the children and it was really around the process of contemporary art that children are asking these brilliant questions you know how 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 can you bring the outside inside and they turf their, their classroom how can we how big does a map have to be to be inside it so starting there rather than with a packaged delivered curriculum that's assessed I think um, you know, I think 
that is where we need to kind of rethink everything. So in terms of Nesta and, and the whole focus on um, early years particularly, but interestingly, Andrew, I, I found a quote yesterday. I had a, uh, a capture. I'm trying to persuade Matthew Bisco, who you know, who's assistant head and the lead pastoral care now in Plymouth. I'm trying to persuade him to do a PhD. And he said, he wrote back to me and he's, I said, just, you know, what's your main concerns? And he said, um, I can find it. My, my most pressing concern as an educator, um, her, her, my most pressing concerns as an educator have grown and remain to be the fundamental of identity and voice in our commitment to social justice for communities, marginalised, oppressed, isolated, lost, and to understand who they are and the power they hold to become the author of their own story. So the human experience is precious, finite and full of colour, yet is so often stifled by the design of others perceived to know best. So I think that really stayed with me. And the Cultural Learning Alliance have just published a brilliant briefing paper in the early years in the arts and some of the language in that is much more about um, that kind of affording, you know, the affordance in the potential, the possibility of learning um, is so vital. Thank you, Penny. Um, I'm going to now switch it back to the, away from schools, back to the early years. Um, and I've got a question here from Adele Condon. Who asks what practice elements ensure quality co-constructive learning between artists and children under three years? Can you just say that you broke up slightly on the last bit? Um, Sorry. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So um, what practice elements ensure quality co-constructive learning between artists and children under three years? So I think really yeah. for me it's about distilling the role of the adult alongside the, ch the child and I think um, especially under three that kind of that whole body learning moving and learning you know David Armand our patron says you know children so naturally sing and dance and act and play and I think if that environment is loving and care and compassion and companionship we that phrase the adult as companion in the children's learning I think yes and to take the pressure off so that we can increase the kind of capabilities um outside children that you know children Reggio our colleagues in Reggio Emilia I was there just before the pandemic hit for the um celebration of Loris Malaguzzi's 100th birthday and just that idea that um you know we're inviting this sense of agency where the children can really be who they want to be it, it is about being human it's about expressing our ideas in so many different modalities and that starts from the moment of birth that the phrase you know children are competent and creative from the moment of birth and the image of the child in the UK is not necessarily well maybe maybe Wales and Scotland um, an island, but in England, the image of the child, especially in our uh, curricula plural, is necessarily um, valued so much. So I think we need to see children as powerful thinkers and knowledge makers and really be a alongside their self directed play. We had a lovely project in um, the second lockdown with seven local schools, and we were thinking about imagination and outside and nature and play and food and sensory experience and we invited working with the local artists we lucy cassidy we designed the society for the protection of magical creatures where the children would come in and adopt a magical creature and then look after it and that's beautiful uh, and that could be i mean i think the principles of the early years should go all the way through education yeah. thank you penny i'm conscious of the time i'm gonna ask you one cheeky last question um before we wrap up um so just a very um it's quite a big one but if you can just um yeah sum it up in uh as best you can in maybe a couple of minutes that would be amazing um so our mission's goal i'm going to reframe it actually away from school readiness and gaps to something around um actually enabling the human potential of every child regardless of income and where they live and um 
the family that they're born into by age five. So enabling everyone to have the same opportunities to realise their potential. Um, and, and our goal is very much set around 2030. So it's about bringing everyone into the same or narrowing the differences between those growing up in poverty and, and those who aren't by 2030. Um, so in one or two sentences, or, or sort of a couple of minutes, I'll give you a bit longer. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you like childhood to look like by 2030? Or if you want, you can narrow this to sort of maybe children's educational settings. Gosh, well, I mean, that's a massive question, Emma. And I think, OK, I, I have an idea. I think that we need to reimagine learning and reimagine childhood and give children. I was on a call the other day with Bayou Akamalafe and he was talking about, you know, we need to learn from children with children. We're born from children, not the other way around. So we need that invitation for childhood to be reimagined. And in our local context, we're thinking about, you know, working with UNICEF around the concept of the child's friendly city where children have freedom of the city that they have, they can learn in just as our work with Cambridge Curiosity and Imagination and Goldsmiths and um, our university, thinking about um, the spaces of liberated learning, but all the time and everywhere, learning is everywhere. It's not just at school. And I think that's where I would I would suggest that we have a commissioner for imagination and future generations in every nation. So that was a very short answer to a very big question. No, that's a brilliant way to end a commissioner of imagination and future generations. What a fantastic way to wrap up our conversation and what an amazing um I think it gives it a sort of a, a grounded focus um in terms of how those things might manifest in in, in going forward so thank you um so thank you everyone i mean what an incredible um questions that you've shared um it's been a really interesting discussion um and it's provided so much food for thought um i hope everyone in the audience has found it useful um now that we've reached the end of the event i'd be really grateful if those joining us could please fill in a short survey and the link will be shared in the chat and is also available in the events description and as a thank you for filling out the survey, you will be entered into a prize draw to win a £50 bookshop.org voucher. Um, before we wrap up, I'm just going to say that our next episode of Nesta Talks will be on Thursday, the 23rd of February. And we'll be sitting down with Dr. Dylan Yamada Rice to discuss storytelling in the digital age and how immersive entertainment can support children's childhood development. So please go to our website for more details and sign up um, or sign up to our newsletter to keep in touch about more events like these. Um, and before we finish, I just want to say an enormous thank you, Penny. That has been the most stimulating, most inspiring conversation. And I'm sure I mean, I'm taking away so much from it. I think it, you know, these can be quite challenging times. They are very challenging times on many levels. And I think um, the, the insights you've given today and the, the inspiration, it really just, I think, will charge all of us up to continue this work and, and to have hope, to have hope for the future and for, for, the, for, the, for the children being born today. Um, that their lives, you know, will, will be positive, meaningful and, and full of joy. And that's that's what we will hope for. Um, so that's all for me again. Thank you once again, Penny, for such uh, an amazing conversation. And thank you so much to the audience for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you for having me.